All right, first of all, any questions from the tutorials? You've done two of the tutorials now, is that right? Everybody has done the two tutorials. Aren't they good? Aren't they useful and clear? Jamie, you want to say something? Oh, OK, you're saying, oh, they're wonderful. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? I think these tutorials are so well done and so informative. They pretty much clear up a lot of questions that you might have about plosives, about voicing, voicelessness, aspiration, et cetera. They make it very, very clear, and they teach it step by step. So I think they're really great. And we are now assigning the third tutorial. There are three altogether. Please do the third one before Monday. This is Plosives Part 2, VOT and Aspiration. What is VOT? What does it mean? What does VOT stand for? If you don't know, then learn from the tutorial. VOT stands for something important related to what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to assign page number 10 of Phonetics 1. It's called Writing Chinese in IPA and the International Phonetic Association. Now, I may have mentioned it to you before, but now I'm formally giving you this assignment. Read this page carefully. And you will find that there are several links with several alternative systems or schemes for writing Chinese in IPA, for transcribing Mandarin into IPA. And I want you to pay special attention to the one by Li Wen Zhao, Zhao Shou. Wen Chao Li, Li Wen Zhao. You will find the link on the page. Write it down. It's important because you need to learn his system. That's basically the system we're using in this class. He's a professor at San Francisco State also a good friend of mine, and his system makes the most sense to me. There are many different alternatives, and all of them have something strange about them. Most of them are not about Taiwan Mandarin, but his is. And it's very simple. It's pretty much like the other systems you will see, but it's especially adapted for Taiwan Mandarin. Not 100%, but we're not going for 100%, because we're doing broad transcription, and we'll talk about that uh, very soon in our chapter. So, especially look at pages three and four. Page three and page four. If you're in a hurry and you really don't feel like plowing through a lot of stuff, print out page three and page four, about an inch will lie, because that will give you tables of the consonants and vowels of Mandarin. What is the biggest difference between romanization and IPA as regards purpose? What is the biggest difference between the two? Anybody? As regards the use, the purpose of romanization as opposed to IPA. You know, it's all a matter of degree. Both of them have their degree of objectivity and subjectivity. You can say that, also you have to decide, uh, define what you mean by objective and subjective. So it's a start, but not quite precise enough. Anybody else? The purpose. What are the different purposes of these two systems of representing Mandarin? Anybody? When you're out driving, riding your motorcycle, walking, taking buses, whatever, do you see IPA symbols anywhere? No. What do you see? Because you have place names here in Chinese. And assuming that, <coughs> excuse me, that some people who come here don't speak Chinese or don't read Chinese, what do we need for them? We, it's not English. It's not English. Don't call it English. Be we need something in romanization. Otherwise, how can they read it? We need romanization for people who don't read Chinese characters to be able to access certain names, place names, personal names, Certain words, for example, what are some Chinese words that are now used in English? 
Louder, please. Gong Fu is a good one. We used to write it like this, and some people still do. And that's because this does not look like Han Yu Pinyin, does it? It's not. It looks like Kung Fu. And when you hear people talking in English about it, they will say Kung Fu. Kung Fu fighting, you can find the pop song on YouTube. Kung Fu fighting, they don't, they don't say Kung Fu fighting. But that may be changing now because we're using Pinyin more and more for anything in Chinese. This is in Wei Giles, Wei Toma Shi de Luoma Pinyin. Yang Si Ge. And don't say it's English, it's using the Latin alphabet. It's writing Chinese sounds in the Latin alphabet. It's not English. People just generalize. If anything is, is in letters, in, in, in Latin letters, they often call it English. But it's writing Chinese with the Latin alphabet. So one purpose of romanization, you should know this actually because I told you to read two articles by Li Wenzhao 老师,又是他的,那两篇看了吗?还没看的话, put it in your homework. There are two essays about romanization by Li Wenzhao 老师, and they are in Phonetics 1, page 13, romanization 3,你如果还没有读的话, because these may also come up in the test. It's written, both pieces are written in Chinese. They're very easy to read, and they make the question very clear. Make sure that you read them. So as I, as I was saying, romanization is one important purpose, is for people who don't read Chinese, but they still need to be able to, for example, they need to find a place on a map, and that place is called Gongguan. We have to write Gongguan in letters they recognize. Now with, with Kung Fu, as you said, the real way to say it in Chinese is gong fu or gong fu. And now it would be written like this in Hanyu Pinyin. Another popular word is qi. We talk about qi. Okay, so qi bu zu. You know, he doesn't have the right kind of qi or he needs to work on his qi. We now use that quite a bit. Tai ji quan, zheng ge ci ke neng ye yo. And there's another one that's become really popular lately, which will make you laugh. Yeah. You know about that. It's become really popular. There are TV programs hosted often by blonde Americans teaching you about feng shui. And we need to be able to write it. If we're talking about it, we need to be able to write it. So that's a use of a romanization system, not the only one. Another use of a romanization system, well, why don't you read the articles? We'll discuss it another time when you're more prepared, OK? So assignments, writing Chinese and IPA, and you concentrate on Li Wenzhao's article. It's not that I'm just 那么那么偏爱那个李文昭,他的东西好,那就没办法. Okay, page three and four, look at them carefully, print them out because we'll need them in class. And then, romanization three, two essays, Yang by Li Wenzhao, in Chinese about romanization. So you have a clearer idea of the differences between romanization and IPA symbols, the different purposes of the two. They have very different purposes. That's it. The rest of the class, we're going to concentrate on chapter two. Let's go. And go ahead, your name, and please read. Vivian. Okay. Um, for the most part, we describe only the significant articulations rather than the details of the sounds. For example, when saying the English word Thai. Say it again. For example. For example. That's good. When saying the the, uh, the the English word Thai, not li, the 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 yeah, the English word Thai. Some people pronounce the con the consonant with the blade of the tongue against the alveolar ridge. Did you say tongue? Tongue. Just make sure that it's velar tongue. Okay. Others with the tip. Is it others? What is that vowel? Is it a? Ah? It's not ah, uh, it's uh. Everybody please note this. Uh. And remember it's a Z sound at the end. Everybody, others. others. And not only that, it's not ah, uh, it's uh. That's kind of a big uh. I guess I'm, I was being very emphatic. Let's make it closer to the size of the others. Of the others. 
All right, it's wedge upside down V. There. It's not only a different vowel, but it has a different length. Which one is longer, the Taiwan English version or the standard English version? Yeah, which one's longer? Listen, here's Taiwan English, the others. American English, the others. The Taiwanese version is very long, but it should not be long. It's a ah, wrong vowel, too long, wrong length. Put your tongue a little bit more to the center and make it short. Everyone, others. others. The, others. the others. And there's a very short linking vowel between the two. It's a y. So it sounds like the y. And the stress is here. The others. The others. The others. The others. We, have a, we have an e sound here, and it's coming right before another vowel. And to link it, if it's e or i, we use a y as a linking sound. If, and it's not very strong, don't overdo it. Don't say the others. It's just a transitional sound for, to link the two smoothly so we can avoid a glottal stop. We don't like the others. Well, I say I don't like it. Now, young people now often say the others. The others. The, z. Linking vowel or a linking, not sorry, not vowel, it's a, it's a glide, a linking glide. They just put a glottal stop there. The others, the others. Okay, 年轻人很多是这样讲, and 有一些不是那么年轻也会. Okay, but the way I do it is the others. I think that's, it's the textbook version, more standard. I think it's good to learn it, but just keep your ears open, you will hear variations. Everybody, the others. The others. The others. The others. Make it really clear in your notes because a lot of uh in Taiwan English become ah. Uh. What is the reason for this? There is a reason. I've mentioned it in class before. Do you remember? Some of the funny pronunciations, from my point of view, funny pronunciations in Taiwan English are from the DJ period. When what was the standard? British English was the standard. And this sound in British is a little bit like ah. It's not so long. It's much shorter. So if you compare this in American and British, American cup, British cup, cup. It sounds like ah, right? cup. But it's quite close to ah, so cup, cup. So if you're learning the British, British ah, it's easy for you to say others, because it's a and I know that in my kids' 参考书, I found that it said, 这个音就等于注音符号的这个音. Yes. I don't think I've kept the book. It's from about 15 years ago. <laughs> but I bet you still can find books like this. Because of a lot of 参考书, there is a lot of misinformation out there. The teachers probably pronounce it that way anyway. So it's going to take a lot of effort and motivation. If you want to fix it, if you want to sound better, more correct, more consistent, then you're going to have to make an effort. And wedge. All right? Try again. <coughs> others, uh, others with the tip of the tongue. Good. This kind, of, this kind of difference in articulation does not affect the meaning of the word and is not usually transcribed. Usually. Usually. That's better. And we'll begin by considering just the simplest form of transcription, sometimes called a broad transcription. Very good. And you didn't say broad. That's good. Because a lot of people do. Broad. Everybody, broad transcription. Broad transcription. We're going to contrast it with narrow transcription. And this is a good time to talk about this is a good time to talk about slashes and brackets. For example, this is how we write it in broad transcription. When we're using broad transcription, we're using a phonemic system. That means each phoneme has one symbol, and we don't change the symbol even if the sound changes in certain contexts. 
For example, it looks like water, but you know we don't say water in American, we say water. They're assuming that you know the rule that when T comes be between two vowels, it often turns into a tap. They depend on you to apply the rule yourself. They just tell you the sound we're talking about, so T ne le de in. T ne le de in, xia men yo hen duo bu tong de bian ti, bu tong de ke neng xing. Ke zi wo bu gao su ni na yi ge, na zu si xi jie, na si ni zi ji zhi dao. Yin wei ni xue guo zhe xie gui zi, ni zi ji zhi dao, ni zi ji qu ying yong qu. That's what xie xian means, if you didn't know before. Were you clear on this before or not? Ben lai zhi dao hai zi bu zhi dao. All right, I don't know if I mentioned it before. I may have sao yi ti guo yi xia. But when you are using slashes like this, that means a broad transcription. You're using a broad transcription, which means you're not going to give a lot of phonetic detail. And it is a phonemic transcription. You're using phonemes. You're not using different allophones. It's a phonemic transcription. Phoneme, you're using phonemes. It's a phonemic transcription. So that means you're missing a lot of details. If you start adding details, we don't use the slashes anymore. We use the brackets. And we will write it, for American, we'll write it like, what do you put here? Tap. That is a more narrow transcription. There are degrees of narrow transcriptions. You can put there's no end to the details you can put in a phonetic transcription. If you try to put in too much detail, you will get exhausted. So most of the time, we don't want it too, too narrow. It's too much work, and it's a lot of trivial detail we don't really need. The question is, what is the right level of detail? It depends on the purpose. There is no one answer. I want enough detail so that you know how to say it correctly, that you won't use a strange pronunciation because you forgot to apply a rule, for example. For American, water sounds odd. It's not wrong, but it's a citation form, and it sounds funny in most contexts. So we'll use a tap to remind you that T turns into a tap between vowels. We're going to use a narrower transcription in brackets. Everyone's clear on the difference? And it's my understanding that in Taiwan, most people do not know about this difference. The teachers tell you either one is OK and they're the same. Is that right? Because even my editors at Shida, they said that, ah, 我从来不知道这两个不一样. They are different. If you see a different notation, there's probably some kind of difference in what it means. Otherwise, there wouldn't be two notations. This one, is, this one shows that it's a broad transcription. It's phonemic. Brackets show that it's a narrow transcription. It's closer to what we actually say. And it has already applied some of the what we call allophonic rules that tell you allophonic rules were coming to those very soon. That will tell you, for example, a T between two vowels should be pronounced as a tap. Everyone clear now? Broad transcription, narrow transcription. OK, go on. OK, um, do we have any questions on this paragraph? So remember, citation style of speech, that's what you find in the dictionary. That's what rookie language teachers often give, and they don't know how to explain the difference between that and speech in context or connected speech. Let's go on. In order to understand what we transcribe and what we don't. What we don't. Stop at stops. Everybody remind yourself. Put a little stop sign in your notes, a little red stop sign, to remind you to please stop at stops. Fix that. It's a systematic problem. Every time you see a PTK BDG at the end of the word, you need to stop. OK, start reminding yourself, OK? In order to understand what we transcribe and what we don't. 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 No, it's not don't. Let's go over it one more time. Continuation rise is going up, but it is not a simple rise that we put at the end of a phrase. Let's go over it again. Remember that I drew this figure like this? We have a tonic stress here, drops down low, and a gentle rise. This is the shape of a continuation rise. We need the tonic stress first. So we don't just say, and what we don't, it's in order to understand what we transcribe 
and what we don't, 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 everybody, and what we don't, and what we don't is not the way we say it, and what we, we're getting ready for the tonic, and what we don't, okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, but not too much, what we transcribe, and what we don't, try it, we stop after transcribe because after that comes a conjunction. Remember to stop before prepositions and conjunctions. What we transcribe, 而且有对比关系, What we transcribe and what we don't. Please try it again. Continue. It is necessary to understand the basic principles of phonology. Phonology is a description of the systems and patterns of sounds that occur in a language. S the systems and patterns of sounds, they're all important, so don't go down on sounds. The systems and patterns of sounds that occur in a language. Try that again. The systems and patterns of sounds that occur in a language. Okay, that's a chanting. Don't you shout. One more time. Mm -hmm. The systems and patterns of sounds that occur in a language. One more thing. That occur. You need to link. And it's a T between vowels, so we don't say that occur. We could, but we like to say that occur. That occur. There. That occur in a yep. language. Okay. Okay. It involves. Uh, it involves stuff. It involves exactly the same thing. You might find it completely different. The last one is a T. The front is a vowel, right? It's a consonant. So we don't say it involves. It's it involves. It involves. Everyone, it involves. It involves. Again. It involves studying a language to determine its distinctive sounds. Distinctive Le sounds. Distinctive sounds. That is, low that sounds. Is, not is, that is, is. That is, low sounds that convey a difference in meaning. Children have to do this when they are learning to speak. They may not realize at <coughs> first. <coughs> stop it, stop. They may not realize yes. at first that, for example, for, ex for example, for example, mm -hmm. there is a difference between the consonants at the beginnings of words such as right, uh, white and right. Mm -hmm. Don't say eh. Okay, I mentioned this to the other class, so I'll mention it to you now. Um, there are a few ways that we can reduce and. and it's a shitsu and we reduce it. So we can reduce it. We can use these different versions. And, 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 mm. all of these are okay. And, 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 mm, are okay. What is not okay? And, okay. This is bi hua. And, yo bi hua. Do not use this. We don't use this. Now you think, why do we use these and we don't use this? We don't. That's all. Just do it the way we do it. Now I think I've told you the story about You have to follow the native speakers. You can't make up your own ways or you will sound weird. That's all. So everybody, and. 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 Mm. Mm. Let's use salt and pepper for an example. Salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. All right, all of those are fine. We can't say salt and pepper. Don't do that. Please, don't. So remember that. Put that in your notes too. No an. Uh. Mm. Mm, un is fine. Un is fine. It? Can you say it louder one more time? Add. So salt and pepper. Is that what you're asking? Just a disanga or disanga. Salt and pepper. Yeah, it's okay. But it sounds funny because when you start reducing, what is the first thing to go? The first thing to go is the what? Woman, yao, ruo hua. This word, yao, ruo hua, the hua. The first one is not seen. Which one? What's its name? The final consonant in this case. 
D. The D is the first thing to go. So, 已经经过两层，然后你又把 D 加回来，半正式半不正式有点怪。It's not wrong. It's okay. It's possible. I'm sure it happens. But it's probably more natural to pick one of those. Salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. It sounds funny to me. It's not impossible, but it's odd. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Let's keep going. They later realized that these words begin realize. with realize. Realize. Not re realize. Realize yeah. that these words begin. These. These. these not these. 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 Yeah. These words. These hmm. words begin with two distinct sounds. Hmm. Two, two distinct sounds. Is that right? Two distinct sounds. 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 Two, di two distinct sounds. Two distinct sounds. You have to go higher for the tonic stress. Two distinct sounds. Two distinct sounds. There we go. Yeah. Sounds. Eventually, they learn to distinguish all the sounds that can change the meanings of words. This paragraph is very important. I know everything's important, but this is really important. When we're talking about phonology, the first thing we're talking about is the difference between phonemes and allophones. So if changing a sound will change the meaning of the word entirely, then we know they are different phonemes. So for example, tie, die. Are they different words? Different meanings? Therefore, t and d are different phonemes. But how about tie and tie? Do they have different meanings? No. So somebody just had a lot of error that day and said tie for fun. It's OK. We'll understand it. It's a little funny. But the meaning doesn't change. So those are not different phonemes. In some languages, Thai and Thai might be entirely different words in some languages. So the idea of what is a phoneme and what is not changes with each language. We're going to concentrate on English now. So we need to distinguish which ones will change the meaning of words and which variations do not change the meanings. They're just variations of the same phoneme. And it gives an example here. Little children, say about three to five years old, they will often mix up which sounds? White and right, and which sound will they choose? They will only choose one of those sounds. Will they pick all R's or all W's? Right, which one is harder to make of the two? R is harder to make. Some people have the idea that languages are all equal in complexity and difficulty, but it's not true. And all sounds are not equal in difficulty or complexity. Er is harder to learn and harder to pronounce. It takes more trouble. W is easier. You don't have to do funny things with your tongue. It's velar, but you don't have all this funny scrunching up of your tongue or retroflex going on. W is easier. And I know from when I was a kid and from watching little kids, many children substitute W for R. And one of my classmates in kindergarten always called me Kelwin. I was Kelwin to this guy. Yeah. So I was always Kelwin. I don't know how, when he finally changed it. He kept it pretty long, actually. Um, but that's common among children. At some point, they usually learn the R, and then they start distinguishing the two. And just because they say white and white, both for right, R-I-G-H-T and W-H-I-T-E, even though they call both of them white, if you mix them up when you're speaking, they will say, no, no, I want to write a letter. Uh, if you say, oh, should I write a letter, the child will say, no, 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 you should write a letter. And I'll go, yeah, I want to write a letter. No, 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 no. And they will say white, but they want you to say it correctly. In other words, you try it with a kid who does this, and they will get very frustrated because they don't distinguish it in their speech, but they can, they can hear the difference perfectly clearly. They just don't distinguish it in their own speech. This is very, very common. It happens among adults, especially for sound changes. Ah and ah. Some people hear them, but they don't make the difference themselves, for example. OK, let's go on. I'm Julia. When two sounds can be used to differentiate words, they are said to belong to different phonemes. OK, I say belong. Mm -hmm. Everyone, belong. Belong, belong, belong. belong. Because the OK? There must be a phonemic difference. Phonemic. 
Phonemic, just like, and I don't say phone either, I use a schwa, phonemic. Everyone, phonemic difference. Phonemic difference. Right, and I don't say difference, I say difference. How many syllables? Two. Okay, phonemic difference. There must be a phonemic difference if two words, such as white and right. Okay, don't make them too long. These are short. White and right? White and right. Right? Oh, right. Yeah. Or cat and bat differ in only a single sound. Single? Sound. Yes. <laughs> Good. There are, however. There are, however. There are, however, phonetic variations that cannot be used to distinguish words, such as the differences between the consonants at the beginning and the end of the word pop. For the first of these sounds. For the first of these sounds. For the first of these sounds. These, these. Don't stress it, but pronounce it clearly as these. For the first of these sounds. For the first of these sounds. How about if we all try that? Because this word in Taiwan English often is this or this, this. It should be these. But don't stress it because it's a shi tzu. So, listen. For the first of these sounds. Okay. The lips must mm -hmm. open. The what? Zui Chun, everybody? Yes. Yeah, we've mentioned it many times. Because I recently reviewed our DVD. So, L I P S lips is short. Everyone, lips. 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 Mm -hmm. The lips must open, and there must be a puff of air before the vowel begins. After the final consonant, Con? consonant, mm -hmm. there may be a puff of air. There may be, there may be, a puff of air, but it is not necessary. It is not. Stop it! Stops. Oh, it is not necessary. Okay, you don't have to explode the T. It doesn't have to be. It is not necessary. It is not necessary to explode the T, but you need to stop. Okay. The way we usually stop, listen, it is not necessary. Was there a long pause there? It is not necessary. Make a pause, 有没有? It is not necessary. So don't say it is not necessary. That's not how we say it. It is not necessary. Everyone? It is not necessary. That's the right timing. 不只是stop, Try it again. It is not necessary. In fact, you could say could you see. could say pop and not open your lips for hours. Your lips for yep. hours. Good. Okay, finish the sentence. If it happened to be the last word you say before the last word you said uh, if it happened to be the last word you said before going to sleep. Okay, let's just stop there a minute. For pop. Okay, watch how I say it and listen. Pop. Pop. Are those two P's the same? Did I produce them in the same way? No. The first one has aspiration, that puff of air. He's avoiding the word because he hasn't taught it formally yet, but it's aspiration. Song qi in Chinese. Song qi. The first one is aspirated, and that's required. Pop. But when it's the last sound in the word, we often don't explode it, we don't release the stop, so we have pop. Now I've got pressure inside there. Remember we talked about how you need to have a higher air pressure behind the obstruction when you make a stop. Now, I do have higher pressure there, but I don't have to let this stop out the whole night. If I said, I just heard a pop, <laughs> then I go to sleep, I don't have to open my mouth the whole night, that's possible. The point is, so stop, 
there's pressure there, eventually you're going to let the pressure go somehow, but you don't have to open your mouth. So those are two different ways of making a P. One is P and one is P. Are those different sounds? Are they different phonemes? Do they make a difference in the meaning? No. So they belong to the same phoneme, in wei in Chinese. Sheng yin de yin, wei zhi de wei. Xue wei de wei, yin wei. A phoneme is yin wei. Some books call it yin su. But that's easy to confuse with yuan yin de yin, with factor, yin su. So I prefer yin wei. That's what I learned in Chinese linguistics. In way is the word for alif. I'm sorry, is the word for phoneme. Okay. Mm, the sound at the end will still be a p. A p. A p. Mm -hmm. Both consonants. Can. Can. Mm -hmm. Both consonants. There we go. In this word. Both are consonants in this word. Both consonants in this word. Good. Are voiceless by labial stops. They are different. But different, different, different. Not d, 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 different. Right. But the differences between them between cannot them. between them cannot be used to change change change. Yes. The meaning of a word in English, they both belong to they both belong to the same phoneme. The same phoneme. Does everybody have this idea clear now in your head? I asked you to read two pages about phonemes. Did you read them? Wang Ye, and they give you some examples. Actually, I may refer to them in class. We use kind of livelier ways to talk about what phonemes are. Actually, it's page 15 that tells you more about it. Um, I think I will just go through it now to try and make the point a little more strongly. Can you see it clearly? All right. So I'm just going to go through it quickly. If you've already read it yourself, it'll be review. And if not, I hope it will motivate you to read it yourself. More on phonemes and allophones. I'm skipping the previous page. Please read it yourself. Think for a minute about what kind of person you believe you are. Then think about the many different ways you act and speak depending on who you are together with. So when, we, when you're with some people, you behave one way. When you're with other people, you behave a different way. How does the way you talk with a professor differ from the way you talk with your best friend? When you are talking to one of your teachers, is it the same as when you are talking to your best friend? Are you going to go up and tell your teacher all about this boy that you have a crush on and who doesn't love you back? <laughs> Probably not, unless they're your advisor. Maybe you'll tell them. I've had that experience. But you're going to be much less on your guard with your friend. You'll be a little more at ease, and you'll be much more casual, and you'll share a lot more information. With the professor, you're going to be a little bit jujin, and a little more careful, I hope you should be. A little more respectful, a little more careful, and you're going to try to organize what you say first so they don't take points off your grade or something. So the way you speak with the professor is different from the way you speak with your friend, right? How about the way you speak with your little sister, your little brother? Compare that to the way you speak with a prof professor and your friend. If you talked to your friend the way you speak to your little sister or brother, do you think your friend would put up with it? I told you to pick up your room. Now go and do it now. OK, you can do that to your little sister or brother, right? I don't think you would do it to your friend unless, unless your relationship allows it. It's possible, but not usually. And the way you talk to a department store cashier, ah, uh, right? You're going to talk like that, but you won't talk like that to your friend. They would think you were being really distant and unfriendly. Someone of the opposite sex you're interested in, now you're really going to behave differently. Now you're going to start to sa jiao, right? That's for, for Stanley instead of sa jiao. All right, sa jiao. You're going to try to act charming and act flirtatious, right? That's appropriate if you're interested in this person and they might be interested in you. You could say that a phoneme is you. And allophones are who you become when you're around each different person in your life. You've got a professor phoneme, a allophone. You've got a little brother allophone. You've got a best friend allophone. And a, there's a guy I like allophone. <laughs> Those are all different allophones of you, the phoneme, right? They are all you. 
you are acting really differently in each situation, but you are still you, right? You feel like the same person inside, right? Each one brings out some different aspect of your personality, just as different phonetic environments bring out different allophones of the same phoneme. So for example, two vowels on each side of a T will bring out the tap side of a T. There are sides of you that you would never show in certain situations. For example, you wouldn't think of being flirtatious when giving a formal speech. All right? Some, uh, 赵丽莲基金会请你去演讲,然后你就开始真的暧昧. <laughs> That's really weird and inappropriate. In spite of all the different faces you show different people, you are still the same you, right? So try to carry that idea over into phonemes. You are the phoneme. All of those different ways you behave and talk, those are your allophones. 可以吗? 清楚吗? Okay, we're going to stop right there. Um, I'll turn the lights back on. This idea of phoneme is very, very important. But when we're talking about phonemes, we're talking basically, basically about phonology because we're talking about the structure of the sound system. phonology or phonetics. phonetics. We need these ideas to do phonetics. We need phonetics to do phonology. But when we're talking about structure, we're talking about phonology. Excuse me. Let's go on. Stanley, we cannot rely on the spelling to tell us whether two sounds are members of different phonemes. Mm -hmm. of, 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 yep. of different phonemes. Good. For example, the words phone and a form begin. What's the second one? Oh. Uh, phone right. and a form right. begin with uh, the same sounds, although they have different spellings. To take a more complex uh, em uh, exam uh, uh, examples, the sounds key, mm -mm. the words or oh, the words key and card begin with begin begin Good. begin with. What we are regarded as With what? Uh, what we can regard as the same sound, despite that the fact, uh, despite the fact that one is spelt spelled with the letter K and uh, the other with C, but in this case, the two sounds are not exactly the same. The words key and car begin with slightly different sounds. If you whisper just the first consonant in these two words, you can probably hear the difference. You can. You can probably <coughs> hear the difference. 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 Yeah. And you may be able to feel that feel. feel that your tongue touches the your tongue what? touches there or we touches go. Yeah. touches the roof of the mouth in a different in in, in, a in a different place with each word. In a different place? In a in a different place for right. each word. Right. Uh, this example shows that there may be very subtle differences between members of a phoneme. Everybody notice B is not pronounced in subtle. Like a B will find in that. Oh. Uh -huh. Subtle. Shows that, shows that there may be very subtle differences between a uh, uh, members of phoneme of a of a phoneme mm -hmm. these sounds at these, uh, these the sounds these it's not both of these oh the sound oh the sounds at the beginning of keys and cards are slightly different but it is not a difference that 
change the meaning that of, what that changes Ch changes mm -hmm. the meaning of a word in English in English in English yeah, in, yeah. Uh, uh, they are both members of the same phony very good excellent reading so car key we've done this before let's do it again car, car. Key. key say them back and forth and feel your tongue moving car key car key all right now whisper just the first consonant Which one is higher? Key is higher. That's the F2 that's higher. Remember, we learned about F2. Because you're getting ready to say an E sound. So the consonant already sounds different. All right, we're going to stop there for a break. OK, let's start. I know there are a couple more people. We're just going to have to put up with it. All right, we're going to continue with the third paragraph on page 34. We noted that. Or we noted other small changes in sounds that don't affect the meaning in chapter one. We saw where the, that the tongue is farther back in true than in T. We already, we've been over that twice at least. T, the tongue is more front, true, it's a little further back. And that the N in tenth is likely to be what? What kind of dental? Interdental, tenth, tenth, tenth. Because we're getting ready to say the th sound the N ends up interdental as well. That's called coarticulation or assimilation, tonghua. Whereas the, ten, uh, the N in 10 is usually what? Alveolar. So we're just touching the alveolar ridge for 10 because there's no th there to make us want to stick out our tongue. In some cases, the members of a phoneme are more different from one another. So N and N. Sticking out your tongue a little more is not really so different. Ten, tenth, 差别不是非常大. And most native speakers do not notice that they are doing that. But you also don't notice the allophonic variations of Mandarin very much either. Just like my famous example, if you're a former student, 一万两万的万加一二三的一, how do you say it? If you say it carefully, it's one, e. But if you say it more casually and normally, it's yi. Do you have an alveolar N in there? No, there's no N in there at all. You have a nasalized vowel. You probably did not know that before unless you're a former student, and I've told you. <laughs> but if you're not a former student, you may not have noticed that if you have a final un sound, and then the next word starts with a glide of some kind, some kind of approximate, like e or w. For example, 15,000 in Mandarin is 15,000. E one wu. Is it e one wu or e one wu? Some of you laughed at the e one wu. You think it's really funny. Because you don't say it that way, you say e one wu. That is the result of an allophonic rule in Mandarin that tells you, 前一个词,前一个字,如果最后一个音是嗯,下一个字是华音, there are many kind of sounds that will change the sound of the preceding n sound. So, one e becomes one e. that's an allophonic rule. Almost no Chinese knows this. All of you do it, very few of you know it. The same is true of any person, any native speaker of any native language. Just like I never knew that there were two L's. Like listen and pull. But listen and pull. Native speakers often do not know at all what's going on. And it gets really complex. If you look at Minayu, that's a kind of allophonic variation. In that case, we call it tone sandi. We call that tone sandi. If you take a class in Minayu, 
they will call it 转调. For example, 我 in Minayu is 我. 我, 不对啊, 单独念, 我, 我, all right, 我是, compare those two tones, 单独念, 我, 然后呢, 我是, 我是, 我, 声调是不是变, 从降调, 变成一个高频调, is that right? That is a kind of allophonic variation as well, but we call that tone sandi, 转调, and you probably don't know the rules for this in Minayu, is that right? 有些人可能上过闽南语的课,有没有?学校有没有上过? 你们这一代不是有上过吗? 没有,我现在可能就是民进党在位的时候 你们的下一届,你们太老了,OK?你们的下一届,可是我觉得这个闽南语已经教很久了。就是现在大二的那一届开始。Oh, okay. <笑> really? 你们有了,but you didn't take the class? 你有。对,乡土课,不是有吗? 他有没有教转调?Ha, there you go. There's a reason for that too, and that is maybe most of the kids already speak Minayu. And they already do it naturally. They will be very confused. And That's the hardest part because they are very complicated rules. How you change the tones if there's another word after it. 那转调的规则还蛮复杂的 And most, at least in my observation 除非是从小就是很用心在学台语的话 那个外省人通常讲台语就是声调很怪 That's my observation 也许我错了,我不知道 OK, so anyway That's an example of elephantic variation that native speakers are not aware of 明明是你的母语可是你这个有很复杂的这些规则你都会应用的很正确可是一点感觉都没有 没有察觉到它的存在, right? That is typical of allophonic variation, and you should put this in your notes separately, because it is like a universal. And here I am, I'm a linguistics professor teaching phonetics. I bring things from English over into foreign language learning that I don't notice, because it's my native language, and it's something I'm not very aware of. 即使我是很 很有心的去学过这些东西，我还是不知不觉带了一个我自己没有很非常的察觉到的一个东西，会带到一个外语来用，然后那个外语根本没有那个规则，听起来就很很奇怪。And my example is when I went to Georgia some years ago. In romanization, that's the word. How would you say it? Okay, that's a very American-sounding pronunciation. That's very good. Um, it's Arian. But when I learned it, I would keep saying Arian. Arian. And my teacher corrected me, and he discovered where the mistake was. And I really admired him for finding out what the problem was. I was kind of both embarrassed and happy that he, he got that. What did I do wrong? I said Arian. Arian. I used a schwa. You got it right away. OK, and I have told this story before in another class. but. I said Arian, and 我一点感觉都没有,我觉得那是没有中音的,然后呢,很自然就念出一个刷,我也没有去注意我念的是刷, I just did what I always do normally, so I said Arian, he said no, 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 we don't do it that way in Georgian, it's Arian, Arian, no schwa, they have no schwa, so that's an example of something that I did, even with all my training and all of my awareness, I went to Georgia specifically to watch myself learn a new language, and then I still did this. So it's very important for you to know that allophonic processes, allophonic variations, are usually something that native speakers are not aware of at all. You make the correct variations as a native speaker, you're not aware of them at all. So there are probably a lot of things in Chinese that would really shock you, would surprise you, because you never noticed. You do it all the time, and you don't notice. Just like my example of 电车, instead of 计程车, 你要搭计程车吗?还是计程车? 
Most people do it all the time, and you don't notice it. 从来没有注意过中文也有 contraction 的现象 That's another example. It's an allophonic variation. Native speaker, 大部分是没有察觉到它的存在 That's why it is so hard to correct these in a foreign language. You are bringing over habits from Chinese that you are not aware of, that are correct in Chinese, but you're not aware of them, over into English where they are not correct. And I'll give you a good example of what I was just talking about with Wan Yi and Yi Wan Wu. And this is one I hear all the time, and it's, there's a lot of it in my data. How do you say that? Beautiful, lovely training. Good. The way I hear it very often is one year. Listen very carefully. If that sounds correct and normal, and it sounds the same as what you just said, I want you to listen carefully. One year ago, one year. One year. One year. One year. Does it sound like I'm saying the same thing over and over? You can hear the difference. Good for you. Excellent. Good. The first one is Taiwan English. One year. What am I doing? Nasalized vowel with no alveolar contact with the tongue tip. For the n, there's no n there at all. There's no tongue tip touching the alveolar ridge. Going straight into the glide. One year, one year, and that is very, very, very common in, in Chinese and Taiwan. In, in I'm sorry, in Taiwan English. And where does it come from? Wan yi, wan yi is correct. That's the way you say it. One nega n is gone. Nasalized vowels straight into the e sound. Wan yi. Do you see what I'm saying? Something you do normally correctly in Chinese, 你不知道它的存在，可是你每次都说的很正确。不知不觉又带到英文来，因为你没有察觉到它的存在。你觉得英文反正是跟你的母语一样，根本没有经过那个 conscious thinking， 它就就就进了英文英文了。Do you all understand what I'm saying here? The same way my schwa crept into, it snuck into my Georgian. The same way is the same way that your one year creeps into your English, and you say things like one year. So one year, 不小心又变 one year， 然后没有察觉到。Clear? Important point. It really belongs in your notes. This is hugely important, and very few people in Taiwan seem to be aware of this. This is something you probably won't find out from another place. So please pay attention to it. Okay, to continue. Um, in some cases, the members of a phoneme are more different from another from one another. For example, most Americans and some younger speakers of British English have a T in the middle of pity that is very different from the T at the end of the word pit. So pit or pit, either one. And in British, it's pity. Well, it's a pity, pity. 还有一点色差音的效果，对不对？不是。Pity, it's pity. 会有一点 s 出来，这是因为英式的 stops 比美式的还要再气大一点。英式的是这样子，这是它的特色。美式那个母音可以拉拉长。What a pity! 英国人不会把 e 拉长，他可能把子音念得更重。What a pity, pity. Okay. 所以英式跟美式的 allophonic variation 有一些不一样。Now the normal way in RP is close as I can do it. 我不会完全像，可是已经很接近了。我也刚问过老师，他说嗯很好了。我说以前不是很不好吗？他他说那是以前，你现在好多了。So most of them are a little better than before, but still not perfect. So pity, pity. That's more British, more standard British. But now a lot of young people are saying pity as in American. They're using a tap. That's come into British English. This d is actually quite different from a t, because normally we don't voice an unvoiced stop. A voiceless stop, 几乎是不会变成 voice， 只有这个 tap 的时候会，而且只有没事会，可是很多英文的那个方言不会。So the one in pity sounds more like a d. Consider also the l in play. You can say just the first two consonants in this word without any voicing, but still hear the L. So L is supposed to be voiced or voiceless, and I've mentioned this in class before. This is review. L is voiced or voiceless. All of the approximants that we have learned are voiced. R, 
w, y, and l. All of them are voiced. But when it comes after a voiceless sound, either a fricative or a stop, the l will often become devoiced. Make a voicing, Joseph Putienla. So in theory, it's uh, get the microphone. In theory, it's play, play. But in practice, we say play. No voicing at all. You can still tell that it's an L, but we're not voicing it. So try play. And maybe that's the reason why some Taiwanese say play. Please come and play. Because they're trying to voice the L. That might be the reason. I'm not sure. It's on my web page if you want to have a look and listen. So the L has become voiceless. It's become devoiced because it's influenced by the initial stop, P, P, which is voiceless. Um, when you say the whole word play, the L is typically voiceless and very different from the L in lay. Lay is clearly voiced. Play, it's devoiced. Say the L at the beginning of lay, and you'll hear it's definitely voiced. Everybody say lay. lay. Now play. play. Okay. So it follows from these examples that a phoneme is not a single sound. A phoneme is not a single sound. It's like a jiazu. It's a family of sounds. 都是同性,是一家人,同性的一家人,可是不是单独一个音,是一个音和他其他的变化. Actually, a phoneme is not a sound at all. A phoneme is a phoneme. 这是这个家族的名称,就像你们家的姓. Is there somebody called Liu in your family? 有没有专门姓刘的人在你们家,只有姓刘,没有别的? 姓刘这个东西真的有这么一个人,姓刘没有名字,有吗?没有。刘是你们家族的名称,那你是刘大中,刘小中,whatever it is,都有名字,都是属于刘这个抽象的这个家族的概念, is that right? So this is our second analogy,我们刚刚是说一个人跟不同的人讲话,有不同的个性,不同的讲话的方式。现在是好像都是姓刘的, 可是这个家族里面很多人都是同一家人，这家族家族这些东西本身是抽象的概念，可是里面的成员都是个别的，都是属于这个家的。That's like a phoneme and allophones. 可以吗? Okay. Um, there is a group of sounds, T sounds, and a group of L sounds that occur in English. It is as if you had in mind, in your mind, an ideal T or an ideal L. And the ones that are actually produced are variations that differ in small ways that do not affect the meaning. 同样都是姓刘的,可是每个人的有一点变化都不太一样. These groups of sounds, the phonemes, are abstract units that form the basis for writing down a language systematically and unambiguously. 这一句也很重要。Phoneme都是抽象的概念。我们怎么样运用这些抽象的东西呢? 我们用来设计一个语言的什么? We use them to design what for a language? A writing system. systematic, unambiguous. That's what we try to do when we design a writing system for a language. Now, you don't have the chance really to do that for Mandarin, for Chinese, because Chinese is a special writing system. You have Zhuyin Fu Hao, somebody designed that. But there are still many opportunities now to design writing systems for languages. In what situation would we want to do that? When would we have the opportunity to design a writing system for a language? Anybody? Well, you can do that. And people do that, for example, for science fiction, right? In science fiction, can you think of a made-up language? There's one that's very famous. Which one? About it? In the Lord of the Rings, what do they have? Elfish, right? They call it elfish? Right, they have elfish. I'm not a fan of Tolkien, I have to tell you. So I'm going to rely on you for that. All right, elfish, that's their own language. That's a good example. 
And I think he bases it partly on Old English. 他是受到那个古英文、An、Anglo-Saxon 的影响很深。That's my understanding. 我不是很有研究。I'm just not a Tolkien fan. All right. Another really famous one is called Klingon. If you have ever watched Star Trek the movie or the TV series, I watched the TV series when I was younger. There's a group of rather bellicose, 就是好战的 and belligerent、uh, people called Klingons, and they have their own language. And there are actually people who do a serious study of Klingon. You can find it on the internet. And one father tried to teach his son Klingon natively, and the son learned it. But as soon as the son started socializing, what do you think happened? How do you think he felt about it? It was okay when he was little. A kid doesn't have much choice, but we socialize very fast because we are very, very social creatures. We we just can't live with other without other people. So when he was really young, he did learn Klingon. But as soon as he started playing with other kids, what happened? How do you think he felt about it when his father forced him to speak Klingon at home? <laughs> Would you be pleased? No. He refused later on to speak it. He thought it was stupid. He thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> this is what I remember the story. Check it online to make sure every all the facts are correct. But this is what I remember of it. And this is actually what happens. For example, if you go to the states or Canada or some other country, and you want to bring up your kids bilingual, I think a lot of you have this fantasy. I had a student a couple years ago. 她是立志要嫁给外国人 She just decided she was going to marry a foreigner. I said, "Why? You know, not all foreigners are that nice." And she said, "It's more interesting. Local guys are so boring." <laughs> Excuse me. She said that, not me. She just decided she was going to marry a foreigner. Okay, so it's a good. There's a good possibility if you marry a foreigner, you might settle in another country, but you might want your kids to be bilingual. And actually, a lot of Taiwan kids who grow up, say, in North America, many of them end up speaking only English and Taiwanese, no Mandarin. I know quite a few people like that. 来到台湾可以讲英文，可以讲闽南语，讲得很好，就是国语不会讲。你碰碰过没有 ？Anybody run into someone like that? Well, then, huh? Can't hear. Oh, you can, you can, yeah. But I have met quite a few people like this. 来到台湾很不适应，他到中南部没问题，来到北部，他们要赶快学国语，然后讲的不好，然后被人家笑。They feel really unhappy and uncomfortable for a while. 因为只会讲闽南语，只会英文，他们就是被人家，被人家笑。In any case, what I was going to say was, if you try to bring up your kids bilingual, it's not as easy as. You might think, because if you are pushing them to learn Chinese, some kids are very cooperative, and they may go to Chinese school on Saturday. If you've heard of that, many kids end up hating Chinese and hating Chinese school. Because why? Do you hate Chinese? No. You need Chinese to live here, right? It makes you able to connect with people. But how about in the states or in Canada? If a kid is forced to go to Chinese school on Saturday and their parents want them to do homework and speak Chinese at home, how might they feel about it? Just like the kid whose father was trying to teach him Klingon. <laughs> My friends don't talk like this. Stop forcing me. And then when they turn 19, they want to go to Taiwan to study Chinese. And then what happens? Hoi <laughs> bui. That's the same story over and over and over again. They really regret it. Gosh, I really wish I would have listened to my mother, but I really hated Chinese school. <laughs> I've heard that story many, many times. So we want to do what our friends do. Okay, we want to do what our friends do.、Um, let's get back to what we're doing. Oh, we're talking about making up a language. The reason we took this digression, it's like a yo we did nega tiwala, was because Stanley said maybe if you make up a language, then you can design your own writing system. That was not what I had in mind, but that's true. Can you think of another situation? Yeah. That's right. And how might you come in contact with that language? With such a language, how might you come in contact with it?、Um, Under what circumstances would you have the chance to run into a language with no writing? Sorry. Traveling. traveling. That's right. You may be doing some more exotic kind of traveling. 
There we go, right. If you are a linguistics researcher, if you're a linguist and you're doing field work, if you're doing field work on an unwritten language, sometimes it's written as one word, field work. If you're doing field work on a language that has no writing system of its own, very often you have to invent one. Or maybe there are several writing systems and nobody can agree on which one should be used. You're going to have to decide. Even, even choosing romanization for Mandarin, as we read on the web, page, web pages, if you read them. My W's and R's sometimes get mixed up, too, even now. Um, they had to decide, do we want which ones? 当时要选有那两种选择? 汉语拼音 and? 同用. Some of you read the web pages. Some of you just said you read the web pages. 是汉语拼音和同用两种,对不对? And what was the reason for defending Tongyong? Does anybody in the world use Tongyong outside of Taiwan? Zero, right? Pretty much zero unless they're high white Taiwanian. So why could we def how could we defend using Tongyong? So it's not what, what the people in the PRC are doing. That was all. Political. It was purely political. Purely political. So that was the case, even for Mandarin. Just choosing a romanization system, we already had to make choices. And Tongyong is truly a poor system. So we'll leave that aside now. Um, if you're doing Tianye Diao for example, on a, an aboriginal language of Taiwan, Taiwan Yuan. Many of them now have writing systems, but not all of them have been thoroughly established. But I know in the past 20 years it still was not settled. So, for example, Taiwan If you go to a place like in mainland China, there's a lot of chance to do it there. Or Nipur, there are other Sino-Tibetan languages there. Hanzang Yuan, So those are cases where you'd need to design a language, uh, a writing system. Um, Peter Ladefogut's book, Vowels and Consonants, has an extended discussion of the relationship between written language and phonology. And you can look at that next semester. Or you can read it yourself if you're interested. And he speculates that the development of phonemic analysis was partly due to the writing systems used by European linguists. 欧洲人去研究这些语言, and very often, American or Europeans who went to these countries were there for what purpose? Not just to study language, but as missionaries. 传教, so actually, a lot of really outstanding field work in unwritten languages has been done by missionaries. And there's an organization that will tell you a lot about this, SIL, Summer Institute of Linguistics. SIL. If you look online, you'll find them. They have lots and lots of materials on unusual languages. And a lot of them were created by missionaries. Okay, so very often religion brought writing to a, a people. Um, we often want to record all and only the variations between sounds that cause a difference in meaning. We don't want to have a lot of symbols. For example, we don't use a separate tap symbol in English, right? the spelling tap symbol, We only want to use enough symbols so that we can tell the difference in meaning. Anyway, T and tap, T is interchangeable. Water is okay. Water is okay too. No difference in meaning. Therefore, we should not add an extra symbol just because we say it in a different way. We only want to use as many symbols as we need to show the differences between uh, the meanings of different words, to show that two different words have different meanings. Woman 
we hope we use a very economical system um, to describe language, to create a writing system for it. And when we do this, a transcription of this kind is called a phonemic transcription. We've already written it on the board. A broad transcription, a phonemic transcription. So we only write down this, the sounds in the form of a symbol that make a difference in meaning. Languages that have been written down only comparatively recently, such as Swahili and most of the other languages of Africa, have a fairly phonemic spelling system. Why? If you learn Swahili, it's almost like reading the language in IPA. Why? And the phonemic, a phonemic version of the language. The variation, economical. Why is that? If you learn an African language, that will often be the case. Why? This is not including Arabic in the north. Arabic is older. And that's had a writing system for a longer time. But how about for the languages, most of the languages of Africa? Why is their writing system pretty much like a phonemic transcription of the language? That's right. Because the writing system was created only very recently. Because it was recent, the language has not yet had time to... To what? Why is English spelling so strange? L-I-G-H-T, light. We don't pronounce the G-H. But in German, it's Licht. That tells you that that G-H used to be pronounced something like H. So it used to be something like the German Licht, but now it's light. The G-H is gone. So our spelling system is not like an African language. It is not a phonemic transcription of spoken English. We've got a lot of symbols that have no sound at all. And we have symbols that have more than one sound. So it is not a really tight tight system, right? We've got extra symbols and we've got symbols that we use for more than one purpose. Because? Because what? That's right. Because the time, how long has English had a writing system? Since about what year? Some of you are my former freshman English students. We talked about this in freshman English. About how old is English? Goes back to about what year? Did you bring your freshman English notes? <laughs> <laughs> about what year? How long has English been in existence as a language with writing? There was already writing at the time because of Latin. So the writing was already there. So we have, uh, English began an independent existence around what year? There we go, around 400 or 450. We don't have a lot of things from that period. You've got it in your notes? Jerome says some of the notes. Uh, uh, in, in the introduction to Ah, you got it. It's good for you. We talked about historical Excellent, good. So about 400 or 450, since about the fifth century. That's how long English has been around. We have some very scant writings from that period. The first really long work we have is from about 900 AD. We have Beowulf. But there are other things from earlier periods. So about 450 AD. At that time, the spelling of English was much more, what? It was much more phonemic and phonetic, both. What you wrote was pretty much the way you spoke. But English changed a lot since 450, or we can be more, uh, more conservative about it, 800 or 900. In English has changed a lot in the meantime. And the written language has also changed somewhat, but not a lot. If you look at Old English and then you look at Middle English, you'll see changes, but modern English spelling is very conservative. It keeps a lot of the things from a very early period of English. The spoken language has changed in the meantime, but we've kept a lot of the spellings, okay? This is probably going to be in a test. That's why I'm spending time on it. Okay, suddenly they're writing notes, okay? So make sure you're able to answer this question. Many, many languages now, like African languages or languages of other places that have recently been um, 
been studied and then writing systems designed for them, their writing systems are much more hevi than English because English is so conservative. We've kept a lot of gudong, a lot of dinosaurs in our spelling. But we get attached to them. It's not without advantage. Can you think of any advantage in a conservative spelling system? Sorry? It's the same argument that you can use for why jian ti zi are better than fan ti zi. Sorry, sorry, not me. Not me, not me. That wasn't me. Why fan ti zi are better than jian ti zi? Because they connect you with your past. You can read anything in Chinese, basically. Of course, the forms were different very early. But starting from about Qin Chao Yi Ho, you can read anything, no problem. And things have been transcribed. So all of the literature that we have in Chinese is available to you if you know Fan Ti Zi. But you'll have trouble if you only know Jian Ti Zi. It's the same thing. People have proposed spelling reforms for English, but none of them has happened. Why, do you think? German recently passed some spelling reforms some years ago, but they're very, very small. And German, in any case, is not difficult to spell. German is not that bad as spelling systems go, but English is quite a confused mess. And there are people who are really crazy about this idea of spelling reform. There's, I don't want to mention names, I happen to know some that I met on the internet. And they try to promote these systems, but they don't get much support. Why? I think the reason is uh, because we know that Americans try to change change the spellings, they make a difference from British spellings to establish their own style. So maybe if we have the uh, spelling reform, some Americans will argue that, oh, oh, we establish our own language. That happened with Noah Webster and his dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, that's what happened. But since then, we have not changed our spelling very much. And there are some small differences between British and American English, but they are not great. They really are small. One other problem, Wendy mentioned one reason. It connects us better with our past. Another reason is, do we all speak English the same? No. There are many different dialects. And what's I in one dialect may be I or E or U uh in another dialect. There are quite a few differences of pronunciation. So if we start, especially the vowels, vowels are very, very different in different dialects of English. So if we started changing vowels, we started writing vowels the way they sound with one particular system, you'd have to choose a dialect as your standard. We're going to write it as they sound in American English. All right, who's not going to be happy about that? Everybody outside of America will not be happy about that. The Canadians may be okay, but the rest of the world, no. So it's not going to work. We can't, we can't represent all dialects if we want to have a really phonetic writing system. So that's another reason. There are further reasons. And one thing is that English words with a strange spelling, like fight, Fight, right, fright, uh, slight. It's almost like We have that sort of feeling. So in a way, English words are something like Chinese characters. It's just like, uh, <laughs> okay, so what I'm saying is that there are various reasons why it happened and why we keep it and why we don't want to change it. Okay, other languages, either they have recently, just recently received 
or been given a writing system, or they have gone through some spelling reforms already. 西班牙文也是经过几次的那个听字的改革。So 西班牙文也是相当 phonemic. And the funny thing about Spanish is there are very few things that you can spell wrong if you can pronounce a word in Spanish. But those are the things that Mexicans will always spell wrong. For example, in Mexican Spanish, double L and Y is the So they spell them wrong all the time. So double Okay. All right. Mm. Let's go on the transcription of consonants. We can begin searching for phonemes by considering the contrasting consonant sounds in English. A good way to find is to find sets of words that rhyme. So we keep the same yunmu and we just change the shengmu. That way we can find what the different consonants of English are, the distinctive sounds of English. Let's try words that rhyme, for example, with pi, and they have only a single consonant at the beginning. So we can't use spy, Pi because a spy A set of words in which each differs from all the others by only one sound is called a minimal set. If there are only two of them, we call it a we had that in an earlier class, minimal pair. If it's only two, we call it a minimal pair. If it's more than two, we call it a minimal set. Everyone, minimal set. Minimal set. All right. The second column of table 2.1, and we have to turn to page two, uh, to column, uh, sorry, table 2.1 on the next page, and then you will see just such a list. Um, it lists many words that rhyme with pi, um, but we're not going to take ones that have two or more consonants. Some have three, like spry. Spry means ting ni tong pei. All right, we're not going to put those in. Um, some of them begin with two consonant letters, but how about shy? Does that start with two consonants? Shy. No, because sh is only a single consonant. It's written with two letters. It's called a digraph. Digraph means we write it with two symbols, but it's really only one sound. It's a digraph. Okay. Some consonants do not occur in words rhyming with pi. If we allow using the names of the letters as words, then we can find another large set of consonants beginning, uh, uh, consonants beginning words rhyming with P. A lot of letters rhyme with P. For example, a B, C, D. They all rhyme with P. So that's another good vowel that we can use, a word ending we can use to find uh, lists of distinctive consonants. And it says speakers of British English will have to remember that the last letter of the alphabet is what in, in American? In American we learn X, Y, Z. So it may have been a Taiwan English problem, it may have been a phone problem. But anyway, in American English it's X, Y, Z, but in British English it's X, Y, Z. And not just British. Outside of the United States, I believe, other countries all call it Z. In Canada too. All right. So as far as I know, the United States is the only place that says X, Y, Z. Is that funny? It's just another example. I didn't go into that spiel. All right. Mm. Even in this set of words, we are still missing some consonant sounds that contrast with others only in the middles or at the ends of words. Remember we said that what are two consonants that there's one that usually doesn't begin a word. There's one that never begins a word. Which one never begins a word? Ng, the ng sound, engma. And there's one that usually doesn't begin a word. What's that? Z. That usually begins a word only in what kinds of words? Foreign words, yeah, foreign loans, like genre. And genre is actually a good example, because we actually use that word. Um, we have a contrast between sh and j in mission and vision. We're, we're now at the bottom of 35. But there are only very few pairs of words that are distinguished by this contrast. He has another one. 
Aleutian， 那是阿拉斯加的群岛，叫 Aleutian Islands。And illusion is 典故，刚好这里有一个 minimal pair illusion and illusion, and they have these in、um, the fourth column words like this,、uh, using these consonants. And most of the symbols we use in IPA are the same as the ones we use in spelling, just symbols from the alphabet. But there are some differences, and most of you know these. If you don't know KK already,、um, listen quick and see if you can. Pick up things that you didn't get before. The letter C, we're not going to use it. C is, in fact, an IPA symbol, but it's the symbol for, for example, cha, cha. It's a palatal stop. We don't use it in English, so no C's in transcri transcribing English. We use a k sound, or sometimes it's a s sound, like in city, sell or receive, or sometimes. Two C's together have two different sounds, and that's something also in Taiwan English. How do you say 成功 Two C's, right? The first C is pronounced as, and the second is, and many Taiwanese say success. They don't say success. It should be success, success, and 接受 accept, 不是 accept, it's accept, right? And also another one is two G's. In American, it's suggest. English is suggest. 没有那个 g. 美式是 suggest. 第一个是 g. 第二个是 j. So watch out for that. G in IPA is always g. 这个是没有例外的。只要 IPA 你写个符号，它永远就是那个音。So G is always g. K is always k. S is always s, etc. We need to add a few symbols because the alphabet doesn't provide us with them. And the International Phonetic Association was founded in what year? 1886. We're on bottom of 36 now. And where were these leading phoneticians from who designed the IPA? From? And Denmark. Okay. France, Germany, and don't mix up German and Germany. Don't say I'm going to German, and I'm learning Germany. <laughs> Remember to get those right. I'm learning German and I'm going to Germany, and we've got the IPA symbols on the inside covers of the books.、So、you always know where to find them. The velar nasal at the end of ring is written. You already know it's written like an N with a curly Q at the bottom. So if you don't know IPA, make sure you learn this quick. And I told you, don't put a line here and let the line stick up here. We call it angma. We often call it angma or angma. And then we have the theta, and make it long and thin. I'm just going to have to take some time to erase here. It's getting too crowded. Hang on. So we have angma, then we have theta. Make it long and thin because this is a different symbol. If it's short, 那是一个母音 You can find it in the table. I don't want to confuse you right now, but don't make it too short. It should be tall and thin. That's a theta, and that's the th sound, as in. Three, one, two, three, and not the British one, two, three.、Uh, one, two, three.、Um, we use it in words such as thigh, thin, thimble, ether. Remember, it's not voiced. Breath, mouth. If it's voiced, we call it ev. It's a d, a, cr-、uh, a, a bent d like this with a line through it. That's the voiced v, voiced interdental.、Mm. It says that both these symbols are ascenders. That means that this is going to stick above the line. Because we have a vowel that is written in two lines. If it is above the line, it is called an ascender. And every year, and every year somebody laughs. He says, "Even this kind of thing has a special term." If it's got something sticking up, it's, got, it's an ascender. And if it's got one going below, it's called a descender. It really has this term. Okay, ascender, descender. And let's just throw in sh. You already know these symbols. An elongated s is the sh sound, and then this symbol that looks sort of like a three, with a point over here, is j. It's just the voiced version of sh. And as I've mentioned, it's usually only found at the beginning of words in foreign loans like Jean in French, gendarme, and foreign names like Jaja 
And you probably don't know Zsa Gabor, you're too young. And then just one more thing before we stop. It says in earlier editions, we wrote the English R as an upside down R. And they're probably going to tell you that they've made it right side up again. They do it because in a lot of British dictionaries, like John Wells' dictionary, just for convenience, they write it right side up. But we are going to continue using the upside down R. So put a little note in your book. We will consider, uh, sorry, continue using the upside down R for the English R. And that's a good place to stop. What do you have to do for next time? All those web pages you haven't read, you need to catch up, especially those two essays by Li Wen Zhao. Make sure you don't miss those. Also, the, pa the piece on writing Chinese and IPA, page three and four of Li Wen Zhao, also the Lingua IPA. And also, what else? The tutorial, tutorial number three. And any of the ones that you have not already read, like when I asked you about things, some of you didn't have the answers ready, so I'm wondering if you really read them. Please make sure you go over and read them. Don't try to do it all at once. Just take one or half a page at a time and go back to it later. Okay? We'll see you next Monday.